You're, you are a, I was, I was explaining a sex bird, a sex expert. Yeah. Is that how you would describe yourself? One of the world's most prominent writers on sex and relationships. Sex and relationship expert, Tracy Cox. The lovely Tracy Cox. How do you get sex? How do you get sex? Erectile dysfunction, bang, first yeah. off, I thought, what's going on here? Couldn't get it up. Pegging kit, it's usually when a female um, puts on a harness with a dildo and anally penetrates her straight boyfriend. That's the generally accepted term. That is, I think, my biggest seller, and I have really? 40, 42 products. You know, at the time I was like, oh, brilliant, yeah, yeah, I've just made her orgasm, yeah, fantastic. But then in hindsight, I'd be like, no, she was definitely, she was definitely <laughs> yeah. faking. Oh yeah, not one out like a couple of hours before you're gonna go or whatever. And I've always thought that is just not what I'm gonna be doing because <laughs> that will lead to floppiness. Okay, Tracy, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, it's, it's, it's blistering hot in the UK at the moment when we're filming this, so uh, I think we're both in the same boat that we're quite hot, but uh, you, you know, happy to be here nonetheless. How are you? Absolutely, I've got aircon, so I'm, I'm really privileged about that. So <laughs> I'm not too hot at all. I'm quite good. <laughs> You've lucked out there. <clears throat> yeah. I've got, you know, as I said to you before, I've got double sort of <laughs> glass doors that the sun's <laughs> beaming on. So I'm sweating. And the topic of the conversation today is sex. So if I am sweating and blushing, uh, it won't be because of that. It will be because of the of heat. Course, so I just thought I'd, I'd, <laughs> I thought I'd get that out there before we start. But um, yeah, obviously I said, I said, mentioned it there. The topic of today's video is sex and sort of sexuality and you, you are a, I was, I was explaining a, a sex expert, a sex expert. Yeah. Is that how you would describe yourself? Well, it's really weird like how I, how I got that title because when, when I sort of first started doing what I did and became quite um, famous, I suppose, as a sex expert was um, when I published a book called Hot Sex and that was back in 2000 and my background is in journalism as well as um, sex therapy and so I'm kind of a journalist who specializes in sex but has got the academic qualification of sex therapy but <laughs> but they so I ended up being um, like the book took off around the world and I'm going on all these things and everyone kept saying oh sexpert Tracy Cox and I was like what is a sexpert it sounds like I just lie around with Calvin Klein models or something in practice <laughs> but um, but no it's a very odd term but it's sort of one I've learned to embrace yeah exactly i thought that must be quite weird and you know everyone probably <clears throat> assumes that you're this uh, amazing uh, sort of sex lover but you are probably just you know a standard woman who knows a lot about sex and can help other people have better sex right do you know i said to my um, my husband the other day um second husband i said god you could really make a fortune you know if you went to the media and just said to her you know what? she's really shit in bed <laughs> <laughs> she don't know what she's doing you probably well, get a got a get a really big story well, I did think that, and I, and I uh, you know, forgive me if it's too personal, but I did think this about, you know, general therapists as well. Like, you know, if you're a mental health therapist, I thought, you must have some br brilliant mental health. And I thought, if you're a sex therapist, you must be having some great sex. I do have great sex. <laughs> but I tell you what, the pressure's on. The pressure's on, though, when you do my job, because I do think that everybody, well, probably for my husband, really, because when he first got with me, we've been together um, eight years now. Mm. I think every single, I said, did anyone not ask you what I was like in bed? And he said, no, every single person me asked, every single person asked me what you were like in bed. So I think the pressure's on, but I mean, not now, not eight years in, but in the beginning, in the <laughs> beginning it was on definitely yeah, for men i bet and i've got in my apartment i've got um because i've had my books published um in 120 countries or something so i've got a whole bookcase that's got all my foreign editions and plus i do two sex toy ranges and so i've got you know copies of you know like products ranges and stuff yeah. up on display as well and my friends um call it the wall of deflation <laughs> they said any guy when i was single any guy would come in would just look at that and go oh my god no thanks <laughs> that's way too much <laughs> yeah your house must be quite an experience then walking in you're thinking usually you've got some sort of uh, lovely little architecture lovely little bit of uh, sort of decorations you've just got sex toys and sex books i have and i've got some rather lovely nude um photographs of the uh, beautiful models not me obviously uh, for my books when we used to do shoots and I sometimes I just get some of the images because um, yeah. they used to be quite beautiful and just throw them in my um, put, put them up on the wall so yeah lovely so is that what you do day-to-day -day life now are you uh, do you speak to couples and people are you just a full-time author now or I'm a full-time author um, and columnist um, I've just finished my 17th book which is a lot of books yeah. and um, <laughs> and I write um, columns I used to do a radio show I'm not it's been on a bit of a hiatus now because I've been in Australia so perhaps I'll continue that um, probably working towards doing a podcast like everybody else in the rest of the world I might as well <laughs> and um, yeah so so just doing stuff like that it's always loads of media requests and stuff to keep me busy but certainly not as much as I did 
I used to do tons of TV as well, too much. So you, so you go around the world helping people um, have better sex. I think that's the sort of uh, way to describe your life. And obviously you're writing and, and, and columnist, as you said. Um, what made you want to go, I want to help other people have uh, better sex? Well, kind of roundabout. What happened was I grew up with a big sister who used to work for family planning. So... And my parents are quite open about sex, even though they're not Dutch, like your parents. But they, <laughs> yeah. for some reason, ended up quite open. So I had that sort of, I had a big sister who was very knowledgeable about sex. And mm. everybody at school used to come and say, can you ask your sister this? And can you ask your sister that? And because they all knew that she was my big sister. So I'd like run home to her and then ended up knowing a lot myself. Then, and I think another thing that happened was when I was about 16, my dad left my mum for another woman. And to me, looking at the two of them, it was like love versus sex thing in my mm. head. I don't know whether it actually was because he's still with her, but that made me motivated to, because I really wanted to do journalism at, at university. And instead I did psychology and journalism. And then I ended up doing um, psych, um, journalism and sex therapy. So I think that led me into it. But then I ended up working for Cosmopolitan magazine which I loved in Australia, and I ended up writing the sex columns. And, and then I left Cosmo and went freelance and just specialised in writing about sex, and um, which, which was just, it's just something I'm really super interested in. So I've sort of become this person that gets all the research about sex and brings it, trickles it down and condenses it into, OK, this actually means in bed tonight, this is what you're going to be doing. And that is the secret of my books, I think, is they're very, very practical. Yeah, well, I, you know, Tracy, it's actually quite funny because I think we're quite similar in that sense. So I'm doing journalism at university yeah. um, and uh, broadcast journalism. And I've always had uh, an interest in discussing and being open about sex. As we you know, oh, were you talking go. about before um, before we started <laughs> filming, uh, you know, my parents are Dutch, so they're very liberal with it. And we've always talked about sex and it's been an open conversation. And so a couple of years ago, uh, prior to this sort of uh, update of my YouTube channel, I had a couple of videos and I actually did a podcast with my girlfriend about, um, about sex. And and specifically female masturbation, which I think we can get into now mm. because um, there is such a, I think it's quite a stigma. I mean, I can't really speak for myself because I'm not a female, um, mm. but you know, as for my girlfriend, she won't mind me saying, and you know, for her going to school, she was going in and going, you know, yeah, I masturbate when it would come up in conversation and all these other girls would go, no, 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 I never masturbate. Oh, I've never done that. You know, when you're, mm. when you're at school sort of thing. And she was like, well, what's <clears> wrong with it? Do you think there is a stigma around it? And, and you know, how dangerous is that stigma? Gosh, I, I find that really depressing. How old your girlfriend? Same age as She's you. She's same age as me, 19, 20. Yeah, I find that super depressing because what I, mean, I was thinking about this whole conversation we're having today and I was thinking to myself, you know, everything's changed and nothing's changed. Mm. Everything's changed in the sense that, you know, we're a completely different society than when I started out. You know, we, we're much more, you know, open with gender. We're open with, um, you know, we, we have hookup culture. There's one night stands, aren't anything to be ashamed of. You've got all that sort of stuff going on. But on the other hand, we have exactly the same problems that haven't really altered. We've still got a massive orgasm gap. You've still got females still not talking about masturbation. You've still got, you know, all these, you know, women who think they're broken because they don't have an orgasm through penetration. Mm. It's like, oh my God, has, I always feel like, have I done nothing yeah. to change this, these things? thoughts and I find it extraordinary that women won't talk about masturbation because I mean uh, almost I think as many people women in Britain have a vibrator as they have a washing machine so yeah. everyone's doing it particularly with a vibrator so why aren't we talking about it still I really don't know I mean you know the lads are always talking about it why 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 can't we what what's what's the difference how do you feel like we can try and rid that um that stigma I guess that's what you've been trying to do for the last you know, life yes. in your lifetime. Yeah, I honestly don't know what, what we could do. Um, I mean, I wonder if she said to one of her girlfriends, do you use a vibrator, mm. whether that would get a different response. Yeah, I think it was just general masturbation, but still, I think, I'm sure the vibrator com conversation came up <clears> as well. <throat> Well, I find that really sad. And I don't, I mean, if you look online, if you, I mean, there's, that's the other thing like now compared to when I first started out, there is so much good information about sex out there. I mean, you, you don't, all you have to do is type in female masturbation and you would come up with 20, 20,000 yeah. immediate hits on how to do it. I mean, there is that brilliant site, what, what's it called, OMG, which teaches, which has video clips really classily done of showing you how to masturbate, showing what's up, what it works for some people, what works for others. So there's absolutely no excuse for not doing it. And the mm. thing is, what people need to understand is, especially as a female, masturbating is generally the way most women have their first orgasms for a lot of women it's the way they have any of their orgasms is to use a vibrator and masturbate 
So if you want to understand your body as a woman, you kind of have yeah. to go down that path. You're very, it's very, very rare to end up with a lover, male or female or whatever gender or sexual orientation, that's going to know more enough about the female body, which is quite complex, to be able to teach you how to do it. So mm. it's almost, I mean, they've done many studies on this, the correlation between women who masturbate and women in their orgasm potential and, you know, the amount of orgasms they have is directly linked. The more you masturbate, the, the more women learn how to masturbate, the better, more satisfying sex they have. It's a fact. Mm. I was going to, you know, I was going to ask that question as well. How important is masturbation and having <clears throat> better sex? It's incredibly important for that reason, particularly for women. Um, for men, it's also important because they can learn to... I mean, men's biggest fear is premature ejaculation when, they, mm. when they're young. When you get older, it becomes um, erection difficulty, so sometimes the two can be combined. Um, so if you masturbate as a man, you can A, take the edge off, so you're not like going to look at somebody and have an orgasm because you can't, haven't had sex for so long. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is you could do a technique called peaking where the more you know your orgasm triggers, mm. the more likely you are to be able to know when to stop to slow it all down. For instance, say you're masturbating to orgasm on a scale of zero to 10, there is a point where you're like maybe five is in the middle of like, okay, I'm having a good time, but I'm nowhere near ejaculating. Yeah. Then some men could get up to eight, nine or, you know, seven and eight and hover around that for ages and then yeah. just stop and, and continue on that for a while. But mm. if some men will get to, you know, seven or eight and then that's it, it's all over. It goes to what's called the point of um, ejaculatory inevitability, meaning your mother could walk in and you're still going to have an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, if the more you know about that, you more you know, mm. well, okay, I reckon I'm around about a five or a six, but that's as far as I can go. I know that once I get to that point, I have to stay below that point when I'm with a partner, mm. the better you are able to control um, how quickly you have an orgasm. So it's very important for learning about your body masturbation. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I would agree with that. Um, and with uh, obviously then female orgasms, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, females say they fake their orgasms, mm. or fa they fake their orgasms, and a lot of females do fake their orgasms, mm. um, which is quite sad, I would think, because um, if I was having sex with someone, I would much rather, um, and my girlfriend or whoever, much rather than be open and honest to the fact that listen, I I haven't come from that um, experience, mm. but here's what we can do to try and you know, you might not be able to make me you know have an orgasm for your uh, penetrative sex, but you know, you might. Be be able to do this that might be able to facilitate That's an right. orgasm yeah. um how do you think you know why do you think most women do do that and how do you think we can get around that massive issue within sex it is an age-old problem that that honestly again it, it makes me very very sad because you mm. just think i think i mean people have a vague idea now that they know that orgasms come from the clitoris and that the clitoris is outside the vagina not inside the vagina so why on earth would intercourse stimulate the clitoris it doesn't women who can have you know vaginal orgasms which there is no such thing it all comes from the clitoris it's usually it's usually because their clitoris is larger than normal it's closer to the opening of the vagina so that it's getting pulled mm. um or you know it's some sort of indirect path or they're in a position where the pelvic bone's pressing on the inner clitoris it's still a clitoral orgasm so if you're one of the 80% of women who don't have that going on, you are not going to have an orgasm through purely through penetrative sex. Now, that's a fact, okay? <laughs> the problem is, is that when we go out with somebody, particularly when you're young, lots of people don't know that. Men, a lot of men don't know that. They then go out with somebody, have sex with somebody. They say the girl really likes him. You know, she's out to impress. It's We watch all these movies and TV which still perpetrate this myth that that's what happens. Suddenly you're groaning to a simultaneous orgasm, which again is as rare as hen's eggs. But um, so it's just ridiculous all these things we believe. So then she fakes it because she wants him to like her. Then after you faked it once, it's very hard. Yeah. So in the beginning, you keep doing it because you still want them to like you, blah, blah, blah. Then probably around three months, you do get some couples who go, you know what, actually, you know, yeah. can you, we just come clean here, literally. And, you know, <laughs> this is what's going on. But very few couples do do that. So then you have this myth that was, that's perpetuated. So the next girlfriend he goes out with, say she's really brave and she says, you know what, I can't orgasm purely through penetration. You need to do this. Well, my first, first girlfriend could. Yeah. And that's when, and by the time you get to like 20 as a female, you know damn well that, you know, 
you would be amazed how many guys would turn around and say, well, that's really unusual because every other girlfriend I've ever had orgasms like this in two seconds flat. And it's like, well, actually they're not, they're faking. So mm. no one's helping anyone. Women aren't helping anyone by faking. It's a really a bad thing to do for womankind. We're lying. Men yeah. don't, most men don't want to be told that. Most men want a real orgasm. Yeah, but I've, I've, you know, in hindsight realized in the past, like, oh, that girl was faking it. <laughs> like, and, yeah. and it. You know, at the time I was like, oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I've just made her orgasm. Yeah, fantastic. But then in hindsight, I'd be like, no, she was definitely, she was definitely <laughs> yeah. faking. And I was like, but it may, you know, not only does it, as you say, most men, I think <coughs> if all men um, don't want to be told that, you know, they're making a girl orgasm if they're, if they're not, because it just doesn't feel nice to be lied to really. And in hindsight, I've thought, again, as I said, Oh, is that, uh, that it, almost that experience f meant nothing because the whole climax of it was a lie. So, you know, that, that, that isn't mm. a nice feeling for a man either. How, how no. do you then? I don't know whether it's a lie because, I mean, the thing is, you, you know, as a man, you can have great sex that actually doesn't have an orgasm involved. Yeah. That's the other thing we need to move away from. I think this definition that great sex is you mm. have an orgasm, I have an orgasm, we're both happy. Some of the best sex of my life hasn't involved an orgasm. But later on, it serves as great fantasy, you know, fodder and, and can push you towards an orgasm if you fantasize about it the next time around. Sometimes, you know, sometimes the sex is so intense and so sort of, I don't know, lust driven that you, you can't focus to have an orgasm. Yeah, I think yeah. women have to sort of really focus, I think, to orgasm sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Funny things, aren't we? You mentioned vibrators and sex toys in the past mm. then. Uh, how important do you think it is for a woman to have a sex toy? Well, obviously I'm going to sound biased because I have sex toys, but I've been, um, I mean, I have sex toys as in two ranges that I do with Love Honey. But I, I mean, my first orgasm with, was with a vibrator. They are without a doubt the most effective, easiest way to orgasm. So this is why I think that they're really good because there's a whole thing in life, sorry, with sex that it is about use it or lose it. The mm. more orgasms you have, the easier it is for you to have an orgasm, right? If you're not having sex, then you need to keep masturbating, to keep your genitals in good nick, especially if you're a bit older. Um, and so there are so many, and the more you orgasm, the more your libido stays high. So, mm. and you know, even if you're in a relationship, a great relationship where you're having great sex, you don't, you're not always together all the time when you feel like sex. One person might be going through a stressy time where they don't feel like it. So it's really good to keep you going and mm. keep your libido nice and high to masturbate regularly. And the quickest, easiest, most effective way to masturbate is with a vibrator. So that's why I just think sex toys are amazing at any point. I mean, men, are, you know, men use sex toys I was going to say, what well. about for men? What about for men, I was going to say? There are, when I first started doing the sex toy range, there was hardly any for men. There was um, mm. what you call a stroker. Um, which is a, have you heard of the term flesh, fleshlight? Yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. Where you're just basically, you know, putting your penis in something and moving it up and down. Now they, if you've never tried one, they are quite extraordinary. But now there are prostate massages, there, there are um, penis um, vibrators, mm. there are, you know, um, what do you call them? Love rings are really good, you know, where yeah. you put them and they keep the erection nice and hard. And the little vibrator works on her clitoris if you keep yourself, you know, put close together and grind rather than usual, the usual thrusting motion. Um, so there's so many more there for men and so many for couples like tie up kits. Um, pegging is yeah. a really big thing now at the moment. I was going to say about that. I was going to mention about that. You mentioned sort of mm. uh, prostate massages there. Mm. There's quite there's a huge stigma. I mean, we're going to talk about stigma so much today, but there's a huge stigma about that. That, you know, oh, that, that you know, you're putting up something, something mm. up your bum. You can't be doing that as a straight guy, can you? Like, that, there's, there's such a huge stigma that that's for gay people only um, or gay men. That's not true, is it? Of course it's not true. But I mean, is that really still, even in your generation? Yeah, yeah big time. If, oh I, told, God, if I told so my, my lad, flatmates, that, oh yeah, <clears throat> I've got a prostate massager and when I'm, you know, having a, you know, whatever, masturbating, they, uh, that I use it on myself, they would never let it go. They would never let it go. It would be such a mm. stigma. It would be so, so closely attached to gay sex that they would never let it go. I think the thing is, bottoms are quite a uh, no-go zone for lots of people. Yeah. So I think it's to do with that, right? So it's, it's something that we associate. I mean, most couples will pee together, you know, or pee in front of each other. Somebody yeah. walking, you don't freak, do you? But if, you, no. if you're doing a poo and your partner yeah, walks in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. most people are like, so I think we've got all that tied up in it as well. But, I mean, it's just ridiculous, this whole, you know, it must mean I'm gay because I like having the highly sensitive nose and my anus stimulated. It's just <laughs> crazy. No, you're gay if you're looking at men in 
fancying them and wanting to have sex with them and having sex with them. That's what makes you gay. Yeah. Not enjoying a bit of anal um, stimulation. So this is the thing is that, but also we need to separate here. What people are saying to their friends and stuff and what people are doing are two very different things because anal stimulating toys with young males is through the roof. The sale, I see the sales figures. They mm. are really, really high. And my pegging kit, which pegging, um, in case people don't know, is when um, it's usually when a female um, puts on a harness with a dildo and anally penetrates her straight boyfriend. That's the generally accepted term. But it can mean it can be girl on girl. It can be man on man. It can be anything. But that's the term that, you know, it was coined for. That's the meaning of it, the original meaning of it. Um, And that is, I think, my biggest seller. And I have 42 products. Mm. Which is extraordinary. So, <laughs> so yeah. So pegging is a thing that. So, so I think in in some ways, no one's paying lip service to all this stuff. But in fact, yeah, in the bedrooms, mm. a lot of these things are getting better. I mean, when I first started out writing about sex, you probably wouldn't get too many women who'd have the balls to say to their partner, you know what, I don't have an orgasm through penetrative se- uh, sex mm. through intercourse. Whereas now, come on, please tell me that. You know, once you get to know your partner and if you come from a background that's quite open about sex, surely at least, you know, a couple of months in, you have the guts to say, look, this isn't working for me. But if you give me oral sex, you know. Absolutely. I think in an open relationship, um, a relationship that is open, not an open relationship, um, yeah, no. you you uh, you absolutely should be communicating. And I think if you don't have that sort of level of communication, there's something fundamentally wrong with your relationship because... Yeah, again, from from myself, it, there's always been mm. that communication and there's always been that... Um, you know, in regards to myself, oh, I don't like this, I like that sort of thing, you know? And if you're not having that, as I said, you've got something, there's something wrong. For, for, for men, that again, you know, that, that can't make uh, a, a woman come, what, what can they do to uh, enhance the chance <coughs> that they're, they're going to make their uh, partner orgasm? Let her know that it doesn't matter. That's the biggest thing is to say, look, you know, I'd much prefer that you didn't have an orgasm. We get sorted what really works for you Mm. then. And and also, I know that just because you don't have an orgasm doesn't I'm not going to say that you're not enjoying it or, you know, this whole that whole sort of thing needs to be addressed is that, you know, women feel great pressure to have orgasms. The minute you feel pressure, it all goes horribly wrong. You don't have one. Um, The other thing to do is don't try and speed her up because men tend to orgasm quite quickly. They think women are the same. And honestly, you really do need to settle in. If you're going to give her oral sex, which I would strongly suggest is the easiest way, using your tongue, you need to um, settle in. Mm. Like a good 10, 15 minutes of Mm. Constant stimulation that's nice and wet, that's gentle, that's consistent, that's not switching around, changing techniques. Because women very much, like men go like this with their, um, you know, moving up the desire thing and moving towards yeah. orgasm. Women tend to do a bit of a slow climb. They can mm. go down, but they, if you, if you, I mean, as a female, if you're nearly on the point of orgasm and then your partner suddenly changes technique through oral sex, you're like, oh my Square God. Square one can be square one it really can be square one so you've got to settle in for the long haul let her know it doesn't matter and probably accept that you're going to be using your tongue if you use your fingers it's going to you're going to need a lot of lubrication a lot of lube and nice and gentle and then if all else fails have a vibrator so that you yeah. can bring that in if you know if, if she wants to have an orgasm and because i mean honestly sometimes you just move past the point you clitoris can get overstimulated so really? you might as well at that point just go you know what you know you could be your your technique's fantastic you could be down there for days and it's still not going to happen but i know if i just put my vibrator on a high thing it's going to happen in two seconds and then he's got to learn not to take that as a big ego thing yeah and it's that's... hard it's really hard for men i mean i would feel the same if i was giving somebody oral sex and and suddenly they went you know what i'm just going to use my sex toy instead yeah. i would probably feel a bit like well that's not very nice but it is the nature of the beast when we're talking about the clitoris seriously mm. Yeah, no, you you are absolutely right. I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, a lot of men would take that personally, um, in the sense that oh, what am I not good enough? And you know, get their ego up and mm. try and you know get put their chests out. And that's something that we really need to just chill out on, isn't it? Just you know, yes. it, sex is an experience for both. And you know, you're there. Hopefully, you're there because you really like each other. And you know, you like whether that be physically or whatever. There's um, some sort of connection there that's you know lustful or full of love. That should create a level of understanding where listen. 
I'm here with you. I wouldn't be here with you if I didn't if I didn't want to be. It just yeah. so happens that I'm, you know, I can't <laughs> orgasm at the moment. But, you know, that does, don't take that personally, you know. Mm. It takes time. And women take time to get used to, you know, the other person. I mean, I mean most couples have sex. You know, good sex in the beginning because it's fresh and it's new and, you know, yeah. that, that's what pushes it along. But really, they have their best sex probably, gosh, one month, two months in, yeah. when you've got to know each other, when, you know, you go, actually, I like it like this. And he goes, well, actually, I like it like that. And that's when, you know, you, when the lust is still nice and strong, but you know each other's bodies really well. How do you keep, you mentioned one, two months there. How do you keep it? I mean, you've written a book about how sex get be- gets better at 50. How do you keep, I mean, 50 is a long way off for me, but how do you keep it, you know, when you're five, six, seven years into the relationship, even, I think you've mentioned 18 months is sort of when the, when the lust starts to die off a little bit. How do you keep it spicy after that? Well, with a lot of work, and this is what everybody, there are certain things about sex that people don't like. They don't like being told that lust isn't spontaneous. Like mm. They don't like being told that, right, in 20 years from now, you know, you're going to, well, not even 20, let's face it, probably 10 years from now, you're not going to spontaneously see your husband or partner get up out of bed on a Sunday morning and think, oh my God, I'm desperate to slam you against a wall. (laughs) That is probably not gonna happen. No. No matter how much you love them, But I'm not saying you won't ever want to slam your husband up against a wall, but you have to create desire. It's not just gonna arrive. And you normally have to create desire by planning some things. And people will hate the word planning put with sex. They're like, it should be all natural. It should all just happen. It's like, no, if you actually don't put any effort into planning your sex life and you're in a long-term relationship, you can pretty much kiss goodbye to sex after about 10 years. Mm. Seriously, you won't even be bothered. Because what happens is if you don't work at keeping it interesting, you have sex less. If you have sex less, the desire for sex drops. The more the desire for sex drops, the less effort you make. And before you know it, you're having no sex at all. So yeah. you actually have to... It's, it's crazy, really, because we don't just sit there and eat the same meal every single night of our life. We no. buy cookbooks. We go out to restaurants. We ask friends for recipes. We go, wow, that was amazing. How did you make that? You know, we Instagram our food. Yeah. I mean, it's the same with sex. Why do yeah. we put effort into every other thing but think that for some reason sex is is just going to you know go along on its own without So are you saying we should Instagram our sex? <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't Instagram your sex. <laughs> Honestly, I can only imagine. I mean, when people do, that's the other thing is social media feeds all these expectations. Mm. You know, so and that's ruining our sex lives as well. It's like having, you know, to have the perfect body, having to have these awful I hate that that um, fashion now with the pumped up lips and the cheekbones yeah. and I think it looks absolutely ugly mm. and desperate and horrible and why aren't men doing it you know women are still the ones doing it and and I hate it I think it says a lot about our culture yeah. and I think that you know it's not only finding a mate these days like I get lots of letters from people saying oh, actually really I really like this guy I really like this girl but you know she's I don't know if she really cut it with my friends like and, you, and IE she's not gonna look good on Instagram who cares yeah, yeah. Seriously. You're so right you mentioned social media there as well <coughs> I think porn is a huge part of um that as well that that's basically the social media for for sex really isn't it um what's your opinion on porn i think that's really interesting um i'm not anti-porn at all and i never have been and i've been um pulled up on this before by um well, not sex workers, because I know I've interviewed loads of sex workers and I know that they're really nice people, as I know yeah. loads of mistresses and stuff like that. So people who choose to do it as a living these days and who are intelligent people and not fucked up, which yeah. is often what people do when they get into porn, um, can actually make it into a career and they're completely in charge. I mean, there is that awful part of the um, porn industry where you get people who are being exploited. And of course, I'm mm. not pro that. But, you know, bog standard everyday porn particularly amateur porn which i think is hilarious i think it's i mean look it's never going to go away so there is absolutely no point in getting your knickers in a knot about it people will watch porn men will watch porn the minute their little eyes are open and they can watch something moving they will be looking at porn you know it's a natural human instinct so any female who gets upset about a guy watching porn every man in the world watches porn there's probably Mm. 
one percent of men in the you know I'm, t- I'm talking about in western cultures obviously yeah, yeah, religion yeah, yeah. stops people but but it really is nothing and it's nothing more in most people's case other than just wanting to watch something sexy while you're masturbating that's yeah. it having said that there are men who you know it's it's taught some awful lessons there are lots of young men who use it as sex education which is just bullshit mm. the choking the slapping all this stuff that's making its way into young girls bedrooms young women don't want that some do sure enough but it's a very small niche so just assume that your new girlfriend won't want that and you'd be on the safe side right she'll soon tell you if she does so do not assume that porn is sex education it teaches you the worst lessons about sex it really does i was going to say it's the assumption so i had a question plan where i was you know planning on asking um does you know the fact that we're all doing these more you know in the bedrooms more crazy things are happening because you're Mm. seeing it in porn is that a bad thing and i think it's not but as you say it's the assumption that that's the default that's the bad Mm. thing i think isn't it from what you're saying where Uh, you know you'll go in and think that the girl wants triple back flip anal like or or, do you know what i mean and it's like no you don't want that like that's not the default she might want the triple back flip but she might she might i can tell you now the girl that does want that will tell you in no uncertain terms so (laughs) you know what's that term now it's enthusiastic consent it's not just consent it's enthusiastic consent Mm. and and also i mean why would you i mean that sort of stuff if you do want to get into that sort of stuff either one of you you don't tend to do that really early on now and there's a good reason why you don't number one trust Mm. number two why you know if you're trying to keep sex going for a long time if you actually like the person at least save some things up your sleeve yeah if you if you use up all the kink really early on what are you going to do later to keep Mm. things interesting so why would you go there anyway but also just i mean you know women need to really speak up for themselves and just say look I don't like that. You might have seen that in porn, but that's not what I like. And that's not what most women like, actually. Yeah. So they need to speak up. And men need to just, you know, have a bit of sense. This is <laughs> yeah. porn. It's made up. It's, mm. it's, it's fantasy. It is not real life. Not even amateur sex is real life. <laughs> no, no. Do you, you think a little, do you think a little disclaimer before the porn videos? Do you think that would, you know, this isn't real life, uh, this isn't, or something, how do you think we can improve porn to, you know, not in the angles sort of thing, but in the, in the sort of uh, disclaimer <laughs> sense, how do you think we can improve porn to make it healthier? Just educate people about it. Things like this, exactly what we're talking about now. And it seems to be, I think women are aware that it's not mm. real life, but it's men, men, young men that grow up and just think, they don't bother reading like books anymore. I mean, I used to write about two books about sex every year. Yeah. Most young people don't. I mean, my stepdaughter is 19 yeah. and she would no more fly to the moon than she would read a book about sex. Mm. She would just, she wanted to find something out. She would just type in the term online and yeah. watch a little video or what, you know, and she does. I mean, I remember very early on um, with her and, and her mate, she, you know, we had a big discussion about where you're finding out your information. She said, oh, we're just looking at porn. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, you're like tiny. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's where the they were getting there. It? Yes. That's just, yeah, not only, I think, I think, yeah, a lot of young men aren't aware um, that this that this isn't real. And I think that's the majority. But I think this, the scary bit is where you get young women that aren't aware but don't like it. So they go, oh, my God, this is what I've got to do, is it? This I've got to do all this slapping and choking. And, but I don't want to do that. That's not what I want to do. Um, and, and so they go into sex with a lot of anxiety and a yes. lot of just be fearful of this wonderful experience. And I think that's so worrying, isn't it? It is, and it's a really good point. And I'll tell you what else that's causing is that lots of young people are not having sex anymore. Mm. I mean, there is a you, all the statistics on young people and sex. You would think everybody thinks in this like culture where sex is, you know, not such a big deal. You can get, you know, Netflix and chill. You can just go on <laughs> Tinder, find somebody within two seconds. But so sex is lost. It's not a big deal anymore. And loads mm. of couple, young couples, have sex, and then they get to know the person. So it's not like when I was growing up. But on the other hand, because of things like porn, looking at that and going, oh my God, I don't want to have to do that. Yeah. Or it's a little bit too readily available maybe. Or this, well, actually, I quite liked it the other way. I quite liked the old fashioned thing where I would get to know somebody first and then I'd have sex. So you have all these adults who actually aren't having sex at all. Mm. I mean, yeah. the, the, the age, the amount of, especially young virgins, well, they're all young virgins. I mean, <laughs> the age of virginity has gone up such a, uh, like in leaps and bounds it used to be you know it's just ridiculous there are so many especially young male virgins around that it's not funny and it is you know it's it's sort of sad i mean in japan 
I mean, they're not even interested in sex. They've actually got to the point where I think 32% of young adults were not even interested in sex. They were having relationships. They yeah. were not interested in sex. Now, that's a pretty sad state of affairs, isn't it? I wish I could speak on, like, because as, as I said to you, I've had quite a good sexual education. So I went, mm. my, first of all, my school was quite, I, I thought, quite good with it. You hear all these sort, sort of sexual education horror stories where, oh, you know, it was one day on a Wednesday and we put a, cu- a condom on a cucumber and then we left and that was it. it, it that, I didn't that have that. It. I in, Ameri- I, in America and in Britain, that's about it. Yeah, well, um, well, luckily enough for myself, at school, I, I well, I went to a private school, so that was, you know, the privilege mm-hmm. there is probably, uh, you know, the, the reason why I had a, quite a good sexual education because it was every year you'd do a week where every single day you'd have a different three, four, five hours of workshops and all different oh education. God. And it would be every year you'd have a week, your year group, starting from year five, so from 10 years old, you'd go a week, workshops 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 and it would obviously progressively get more and more so it never came as a massive shock there was never an instant video it was always so it started it when i was 10 years old it started at oh you know his relationships and you know um maybe the idea of drugs don't do drugs and then it went to oh well what do people do in relationships you know they love each other and, and do you know what i mean it, it got progressively more where was real- this where where were you getting this the, it was a, a school called seven oaks prep in kent um down in you know kent? yeah in the south of england yeah so um holy hell I honestly, I've I've just written down and made myself a note to interview you on my radio show podcast about that because I've never heard of anything so fantastic. Parents were really open about it. And and I actually did read books about it as well. My dad, Mm. I remember my dad and my mum, you know, again, from around that age onwards, (coughs) pretty much every year, sex, book on sex, book on sex, and that'll be it. And I'll just read and yeah. God, you're like the model student, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, if you, if all... you hadn't turned out well, there would be a problem, wouldn't yeah. there? Yeah, but I was always really <laughs> interested in it as well. And like, I, I would really look forward to these workshops and... In the past, as I said to you earlier on, um, I've done this podcast with my girlfriend, and I and I've just done and I've done a video on it as well around the uh, uh, correlation between lack of sex education to no sex education to uh, teenage pregnancies in in uh, in America, and I just talked about that and how important sex mm. education is. Um, but I've always been really interested in it, and I even remember once saying to my mate, like, I think I might want to basically do what you do like get into um sort of making videos and educating people on sex but then i thought as a man is that a bit difficult because like as a woman i feel like i, I don't want to come across creepy i don't want to come across like i'm you no. know so interested in sex that i'm like oh yeah talking about no it but you'd probably be better off working with men mm, yeah than women yeah. i don't know that i mean i've done several tv shows on sex and there's always actually there's always been gay there's always been gay men yeah well that's what i thought yeah, that's what i thought because yeah, it doesn't come yeah. across creepy it comes across Almost forgiving, do you know? Yeah, yeah. But you could easily do it for men. Mm. Educate men. Yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Well, we'll see. um, We'll see how it goes. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, let's see. But you'd be the perfect person. My God, with that training, it's almost like you should. You might. (laughs) Virginity. You know, you mentioned it earlier. I uh, still didn't necessarily have a positive experience. Erectile dysfunction. Bang. First off, I thought, what's going on here? Couldn't get it up. Um, You know, virginity. People losing their virginity. You hear so many horror stories. Why do you think that is? Because it's stressful, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it is so stressful losing a virginity. <clears throat> I mean, I, I grew up with um, my big sister, as I said, with family planning. She'd come back, and those were the days when you get little pamphlets on everything. So there'd be a pamphlet on, you know, how to stimulate, well, I don't know if they did do that, how to stimulate the clitoris, but she, I, I knew all about it. I knew the mechanics. I knew that yeah. you had to do this, you had to do that. The penis went inside the vagina, blah, blah, blah. But at no point had anyone ever told me that anyone moved <laughs> so I was or like talked. 15 and I was with a long-term boyfriend and so we were like dead on I think I did it dead on my 16th birthday at midnight <laughs> yeah. or something and we planned it and then he put the penis inside the vagina and then he was moving and I was like what are you doing what are you doing he was like well that's what you do and I was like oh my god this is awful this is barbaric yeah I hated it and then I went home and I've got a really open mum and I said to my mother oh my god this is what happened and then she was like yes darling not most thinking, looking at yourself like, how did you miss that bit? <laughs> but um, so when I was the most planned, you know, prepared person in the world. So, and I really didn't like it. I really didn't like it at all. And I know so many men who, you know, people that I've spoken to over the years who couldn't get an erection the yeah. first time. But the pressure is on and penises oh. don't like pressure. They don't like it at all. I had an erection <clears> the <throat> whole way home. So like it was after school again at sixteen after school on the train I was actually wearing these exact shorts <laughs> and um, and I had an erection the whole way home I swear to God it was forty five minutes on the train the whole way home I got oh, home no. floppy didn't it wasn't working and it was it was a nightmare hilarious that's so funny but it's good that you could talk and laugh about it because honestly if you reach you know if, if 
three men listen to this or boys listen to this and then yeah. go oh okay well actually yeah that is kind of normal of course it's normal of course, of course yeah. it's normal it's so stressful even now and it's and i think it's even worse now because if you were in living in a society where you know most people lost their virginity around that time and they didn't know much about sex wasn't that much information probably like my parents mm. then you're not expected to know a great deal are you it's not expected to go that well but nowadays there's a certain level of education about sex that mm. people assume they they or you feel like you've got to imitate porn stars and move yeah. a certain way or so the pressure's on in so many ways because you don't know anything about sex until you've actually done it in reality mm, you can yeah. read all the books you like like I had, you know, but <laughs> until you do it, you don't really know. So the pressure's on. So I think it's very normal to have a bad experience with um, losing your virginity. How, how can we make that experience better for people? Oh, gosh, talk about it. Um, again, I think uh, maybe plan it. Be careful mm. with who you lose your virginity. And the other thing is, is that what people don't think through is... You know, losing your virginity on the spur of the moment is not generally a good idea. I'll tell you mm. why. Because all that that first experience of sex can, can you take that forward with you or you can take it forward with you and you know you end up with if you speak to people who've got you know real hang-ups about sex often their first time was really bad or so they did it with somebody who didn't particularly you know care for them much and you know they were so they, they you know if there's any shame associated with it or anything like that you tend to carry that through so it's in everybody's interest to make that first time a really good special time which probably means losing it with somebody who you know who you trust i yeah, think that's so crucial um, i think it really is crucial and also planning it a little bit in the sense of you know make sure you're with you're somewhere where you've got time to just lie around together because often it goes wrong the first time and then you might yeah. want to have another go you know like so there's all those factors where you can emotionally um you know look after each other as well it's same for men and women it's a really big big deal losing yeah. your virginity even now yeah, I'd agree. And I, I was so desperate to uh, to lose my virginity that it was just like, oh, first, first, first takers, any takers? All right, you're yeah, first yeah. taker, here we go. Yeah. But in, and, and that was just like, I know, I would say, I, I would say I lost my emotional, like real virginity <clears throat> with my girlfriend because it was like everything, everything before that was just like, physical nothingness and it was mm. like okay well i'm having sex but this isn't this isn't anything like this isn't anything and then when you have sex for the first time with someone that you really love and that you, mm. you have a strong emotional connection with it's so overwhelmingly just wonderful that i i, I always class that as like my emotional and true uh, losing of virginity because it's it just yeah. it, sex with someone that you you know don't really know and sex with someone that you you know, have such a strong emotional connection with is completely different. Yeah, they are very, very different. Very, very, very different. Not to say that you can't have great sex with a stranger because you can. Mm. And for women, often they do because it, it, they're not being judged. They can let loose a little bit because if they don't want to, you know, they're not auditioning as future wife and yeah. all that sort of stuff goes on. But that's, I, I like that. I really like that. I think we should start a thing that you have a physical loss of your agility and then an emotional loss of your agility because you're quite right and they are two very very different things it felt like i was doing two different things as you say it wasn't the same thing for me it was just like no. generated two completely different <coughs> uh, emotions on that on that then uh, erectile dysfunction as i mentioned in my virginity uh, little story um how can i mean it's such a huge i've had it a couple of times uh it's such a huge issue and it makes you feel so bad i've got so many questions how can we mm. prevent it how can we what, how can women react potentially to, to, to allow the man to feel comfortable in that situation etc cetera, etc cetera. it's the biggest psychological catastrophe for a man of any yeah. age i have to say and it shouldn't be because i mean it's a part of your body. Our body, you know, we allow every other part of our body to fail. If you get a sore knee, you don't go completely bananas about it or paranoid. You just got a sore knee. You know, if your penis doesn't work, it's because it's generally because you've drunk too much. You're tired. You're stressed. You're emotional. You know, you're anxious about. You know, you you really really like the person and you want. Yeah. You know, you want to impress. So all of these factors are actually you know, normal, the human, again, it's just, so I think the first thing is for men to accept that their penises are not robots, they're human, they're connected to you, they're part of your body, they're going to yeah. reflect what's going on with you, so don't worry about it, everybody else is going through the same thing, and it's, and it's, it's not a big deal 
and the thing is men need to talk about it more because you don't tend to you might you might be the exception that sits in the <laughs> pub and says to your friends you know what shit i couldn't get it up last night yeah but very few men are going to do that yeah. boys particularly young men are never going to do that well we want them to do that because it normalizes it mm. so the first thing is to realize that your body's you know your penis is not a robot it's not going to perform on cue you know every single time it's just not ever yeah. no one is going to go through life without getting an erection problem no one Secondly, I think you need to know that it's normal and that just because people don't talk about it doesn't mean it's not happening because it is happening. And thirdly, the, if you just don't worry about it, if it's not a big deal, then all that happens is it just, you just, you, you know, turn around and pleasure her, give her oral sex. Usually the erection then happens because you're taking the focus of it. Yeah. Or um, just give her oral sex. Maybe if it doesn't happen, you just go, oh, well, too drunk, too tired, too many recreational drugs, whatever it was, right? Yeah. And then just don't forget about it and it's gone and next time around you'll be fine. It's when you get into this like, oh my God, this is going to happen again, yeah. you know. And then, of course, the next time around, of course, you're going to be a little bit anxious. That is not. Oh, that is, honestly, you've described my situation there because it happened the first time and then um, the second time because it's, it's, it's a bit, I, I suffer with sleep anxiety. So one time I, I got really nervous before a big day and I, I couldn't sleep. And then the next time I was like, oh my God, last time I didn't sleep. Oh my yeah, God. I, yeah. And then I couldn't, it made it worse because yeah. then you start thinking about it more. And it's, exa yeah. it's the exact same thing. Yeah, of and course then it is. It, since then, it, it's just got into my head. But luckily I've got a, you know, a loving partner that, you know, the way that's not an issue. But um, yeah, it's, mm. yeah, it's a nightmare. But it's the same with the sleep thing. If, if it doesn't matter if you get a good night's sleep. So if you yes. think, you know what? Who cares if I don't get a good night's sleep? Because tomorrow I don't have to do anything. Then you'll get a good That's when you fall asleep. asleep. Yep. Yeah, of course. So, so you've got to talk to yourself like that. And crucially, as you mentioned before, you've got to have your partner having the same reaction. And often what happens mm. is that young women and older women, all women at some point, tend to take it on themselves. It's like, I'm not sexy enough. Oh, my God, I knew he didn't really fancy me. Yeah. Um, you know, it must mean I'm doing something wrong. It must mean... So they take it as something that they've done, take it personally, mm. react. And, of course, the poor guy then feels even worse and is trying to say, no, no, no. And then it's like, oh, my God, this is even worse than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So everybody has to calm down. And if it happens, if you're a woman listening to this, and especially a young adult, um, you know, if you're with somebody and they lose their erection, you've got to remember that this is a person on the end of that and they are going to be freaking. It's nothing to do with you. It's yeah. often because they like you too much. Yeah. It's often that. It's yeah. not that they don't think they're sexy. You might be so sexy that they're thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? This is, yeah. I'm going to lose it. And often also what happens is that um, sometimes you'll end up with erectile dysfunction if you're worried about premature ejaculation. Yeah. If you're worried and you think, oh my God, I'm going to come too quickly, then... All of a sudden, you're like, so try and calm it down, and then your penis gets. Well, what do you want me to do? Do you want yeah. me to get erect? You're not going to get erect, and it all goes horribly wrong. So. That's why I've never agreed with the uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the tactical masturbation beforehand, because like, I've seen that people say that before. Oh yeah, not one out like a couple of hours before you're going to go or whatever. And I've always thought that is just not what I'm going to be doing because <laughs> that will lead mm. to floppiness. Yeah, well, it would, if I was a bloke, I reckon it would for me as well. But I mean, it depends on. Of the person, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think it's one of those techniques that people talk about. I don't yeah. know how many people do it. Did you see that film, Something About Mary? No, I didn't see that. Oh, no. it's an old film where, where um, Ben Stiller, and a really famous actor, Cameron Diaz and Ben Stiller in it, and he yeah. does exactly that before she turns up, and she turns up early. And so he, he he's, <laughs> ends up with it all on his hand, and then he puts it through his hair, and she uh. answers the door, and his hair is up like this. With all the animals, quite funny. <laughs> but yeah, no, and, and you mentioned their premature <laughs> ejaculation. That is another thing. Of how long should I last? That ties into that mm. sort of thing, you know. Um, a lot of men worry about that, but then on the uh, how long should sex last, how long does it should sex last? <laughs> well, that's like a piece of string, isn't it? I mean, mm. the average, I mean, they've, they've done so much research on how long does penetration last, penetrative sex last, from the mm. minute you put the penis inside the vagina. Because there was this whole big statistic a while back that the, um, the average intercourse session lasted 20 minutes, right? Mm. Mm. That was not exactly true. Like, that was not that our guy was at it for 20 minutes. That was from start to finish, yeah. right? So we're talking about if you want to take it from when the penis enters the vagina to when he ejaculates, it's usually around, usually three to five minutes. Mm. And that's being generous, right? all right? Okay. Yeah. That is being generous. Most guys, a lot of guys, particularly young guys, where all your nerves are super sensitive because your nerves dead as you get older, one to two minutes, two to three minutes. Yeah. 
seriously, now, most guys who probably have an orgasm in two to three minutes think they're a premature ejaculator. Mm. Well, that is not. But the best definition, so there is no, there is no term. I mean, I'm just giving you that as an average, right, to reassure people. But there is no, right, if you orgasm before this time, then you are officially a premature ejaculator. The general consensus is that it's if you orgasm as a man with your partner before both of you want to, um, want, you know, want you to. Now, I mean, for some people, I suppose it might be two hours, but, but it's sort of like, is it becoming a problem? Is it causing a real problem? You know, some men ejaculate within seconds, some men ejaculate before they even get inside their partner. So yeah, there's, there are things that you can work with with that. I mean, there's a new drug that's proving quite successful. I can't remember the name of it. If you look up premature ejaculation drug, it begins with P, um, and I think it's about to be released, but it did have a pretty big downside in that it used to make you feel sick. Mm. So um, I'm not quite sure whether they've got over that. They were looking like they were getting over that. Now, I used to do a male clinic um, where people would, could, you know, talk to me online anonymously for Viagra. It was sponsored by Viagra. And um, I, I reckon every second question was a young guy wanting to know how to stop premature ejaculation. Yeah. And I w had all these techniques. There's all these techniques you can use. We talked about it earlier about the orgasm. It's called peaking. Yeah. Um, where you can, you know, find out where you are on the orgasm. Changing thing. positions. Yeah, changing positions, desensitizing, wearing a condom, um, all sorts of stuff like that. They were like, yeah, 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 whatever. What pill? All people want, it's not just men, all people want these days is a pill. Why can't yeah. I take a pill to cure this? Why can't I take a pill? Um, and there might be a pill soon. So you could have all your prayers answered by a pill, but it's not usually about that. It's about learning to relax. It's about mm. knowing your limits, knowing when you're going to get to that point where you're going to tip over and it's all over, yeah. all that sort of stuff. So um, I would say if anyone's really worried about premature ejaculation, one of the best books I've read on it is by Ian Kerner. Um, and he wrote um, She Comes First, which is a really excellent book. And if you just look up him and put in Ian Kerner with a K, premature ejaculation you'll find some excellent books he's really good and very practical brilliant well yeah no and on that question on that question then how many times <clears> a week should people be having sex oh gosh again that's that's just ridiculous if you've just got together and yeah. you're 18 you're probably gonna have sex three times a day yeah that would be normal if you're 98 and you've just got together you're probably gonna have sex like once every year true <clears throat> If you've got young kids, you're probably not going to have any sex at all. I mean, yeah. it's just, I mean, they've done loads and loads of studies about this. And the, 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 the time that you have sex as a partner, say you're just across the board, if I have to make any sort of, you know, um, judgment on this, they say that if you have sex once a week, you reap all the physical benefits of sex, including, you know, assuming that you've got an orgasm in there somewhere or some sort of, um, you know, it's got to be good sex in other yeah, words. It can't yeah. just be rubbish sex. So you reap all the rewards of it, the physical rewards and the mental rewards, and you feel really bonded with your partner. Mm. Any more than that doesn't really make a difference. Right. Less than that does. But yeah. then, then it depends on where you're at in your life. Like if you're both quite happy having sex less than once a week, then it's not, it's not a problem. Each of their own. Yeah, but that whole once a week thing um, is probably a good guide for the... <laughs> what is the average couple for you know a couple yeah who have settled in and haven't got kids and there's no other yeah. other circumstances going on 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 sex drive then as well because <clears> obviously <throat> how many times a week you have sex uh, or how how much you have sex sort of uh, derives from how how horny you are how much you want to have sex i guess um and i guess first of all a personal question for myself because i lost a lot of weight over lockdown um i lost 13 kilograms and i, I cut oh my out God. i know i cut i cut out all well Basically, I was in a calorie deficit where I was having less calories than I was burning off, um, and my sex drive just went through the floor. Like it just plummeted. Yeah. yeah, is that is that a scientific thing where if you don't, if you you know, your diet can affect your your sex drive? Um, I've never heard of it like that. Right. <clears throat> it can usually affect your sex like sex drive if you're eating loads of junk food. Sex drive is very interesting, in that I mean, you can. It, it's so dependent on age and stage, your mm. sex drive. Mm. But, you know, some people have a massively high sex drive no matter what. And, yeah. you know, or other people can can say, you know, that they think they've got a massively high sex drive and it just turns out that they're constantly changing partners. Yeah. So if you're constantly having new relationships, your sex drive stays really high mm. because 
it's new people all the time. Yeah. Your true test of a true sex drive is in a long-term relationship because that's when you go through the, everybody's sex drive artificially peaks at the beginning, yeah. it's boosted. So this is where people get in trouble. So you might have the really high sex drive, meet somebody who's got a low sex drive and think, well, actually we're quite suitable because he's wanting or she's wanting loads of sex. And yet when the, when the all the hormones wear off and suddenly you've got the, the tapping on the shoulder, shoulder motivations gone, which is just what the hormones do, <clears throat> all of a sudden that's when you see your natural resting sex drive so mm. that's when you go wow i still want sex all the time but he doesn't or vice yeah. versa that's when you know so probably probably about nine to 12 months in you'll get a general idea about okay we are matched compatibly um sexually sex drive wise or not and can i just say that if you get to that point and you realize that you're on other extremes, you've got a really low sex drive person with a really high sex drive person. Unless you're absolutely convinced this person is going to be the person for you for life, just move on. It, really? make life, yeah. it makes life so much easier to be compatible, to have compatible sex drives. It, I'm not saying it's unworkable, but it can be very, very difficult. Yeah, I've never thought about that before. It's, you have to be compatible <clears throat> uh, on your, in your sex drive. That, yeah, that's, that mm. makes sense, doesn't it? It does. The other way that it makes sense is that if you can be compatible with your level of adventure and how far you want to go sexually. Mm. Having said that, though, I mean, that's less so because you can alter that. You can yeah. help with sex drive as well. But mm, a little bit. You've got wiggle room, but not much. If you're yeah. up here and there down there, I mean, it's going to cause problems. Unless I, you just have, have so much else going for the relationship that you just think, you know what, I don't really care. Yeah. I've been asked to ask a question. Uh, yeah. He said, he said to me, ask her why I'm always horny. Like, I, 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 I think it's getting in the way of my life. The only thing I ever want to do when I see my girlfriend is not for me. Genuinely, it's not for me. The yeah. only thing I ever want to do when I see my girlfriend is have sex with her. And I feel like it gets in the way of our, like, just doing things relationship. What would you say to him? I would say you've just got a high testosterone level going on. Um, it does settle down as you get older. But honestly, I was talking to... Um, a very famous person, who I won't mention actually, who is notorious for having had Leonardo affairs. DiCaprio. No, nothing like that. Brad Pitt. No one like that. You wouldn't even know. <laughs> wouldn't even. But, um, and he's, he's spent, he spent, he just said to me, I am so happy to be old now mm. because he said, the day when I woke up and I wasn't ruled by, you know, where am I going to get sex today? Where am I going to get, and I'm going to have somebody with, you know, yeah. have, have sex with somebody new. And I wasn't ruled by my testosterone. It was the best day of my life because I could get on with my life. So I kind of relate to what that guy's saying. And I, I had a massively high sex drive when I was younger and it got me in lots of trouble. And, and, it, and it can, it's not pleasant to be, because it, I mean, lust is, it makes you blind. I mean, yeah. it does lead you into all sorts of situations that you don't really want to be in. Or you regret afterward. So I feel great sympathy for him, but there's nothing much you can do. You just have to ride it out and yeah. try. We really, just have some sort of just try and get past that instant gratification point. To okay, think it through. Yeah, I really want to do this, but you know maybe I should just have a pack with your girlfriend, sit there and talk to her for at least an hour before you go there, and and talk to her and just say, look, I'm so turned on all the time. You're so sexy. <laughs> how can we manage this where you don't feel like I'm being a sex pest? So yeah. talk to her about how to manage it, really. So uh, finally, to finish up on, I've got a, a couple of questions from people that have sent questions in, a bit similarly mm -hmm. to that guy. Um, so the first one I think we'll go with is, I always seem to queef. Is this normal? How can I change it? Just change your position. So what queefing is, is when air gets into the vagina. So it just means that, and also often what it means is that when he's thrusting, he's mm. pulling too far out. So just keep your pelvises closer mm. and that will probably stop so keep right. your thumbs as close and just change position, really. And don't worry but, about it. If it happens, it happens. Yeah, it's just completely normal. It's a f normal. Yeah. He put the air there. So I don't know yeah. what, you know, don't worry about him worrying about anything. Yeah. Um, the, the other one is, how do I get comfortable talking dirty in bed? Um, uh, I think that one is a bit hard to answer. I think, first of all, you, you have to accept that you probably are going to sound like you're in a, some B-grade porn movie or something. So, <laughs> so try not to get too caught up on it. But I yeah. think that you um, just describe what's happening. I mm. mean, if, like, particularly if that's coming from a woman, it's like, well, I don't know. I don't want to sort of, I just don't know what to start with. Yeah. Just start to say, oh, my God, that feels amazing the way you're touching yeah. my nipples or yeah. your tongue feels amazing. And move from there. And then you can describe what, you know, what you'd like to have done to you. So, mm. so it's just keep it, in, keep it as real as possible. Don't think that you have to come out with 
you know, oh. anything that's particularly crude or you have to swear or you have to, <laughs> you know, give it to me, big boy, or those cliched <laughs> stations. Just yeah. just stick to describing what they're doing to you or what you'd like them to do to yeah. you or I what think, you'd like to do to them. I think authenticity is the, <clears throat> the, the key, isn't it? Because it's when yeah. people start to replicate what they have either seen in porn or what they think they should do or yeah. just try to generate any sort of um, unnatural situation that it then it does that start to get awkward because it's not coming from you. If you yeah. really, you know, if you're authentic and you're natural and you say exactly how you feel, uh, then then I guess that is just the whole, that is the thing that's sort of been through the middle of the whole podcast, isn't it? Just be you, be yes. open and just be authentic because that is the best way you're going to have a, you know, the best time in life, but also in the bedroom. Exactly. And the more authentic you are, the more you talk about, you know, your problems and what you're feeling and, and anything you're struggling with or anything you like. Mm. Just think you're passing that on. Please, young women, you know, and young men, don't create yet another generation of people who grow up with all these stupid myths that just make mm. everybody miserable. Yeah. You know, have the courage to be yourself and, and say what's really going on. Don't lie in bed. It won't I get you anywhere. Absolutely. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been I've an absolute pleasure to speak it. to you. Yeah, yeah it's you been too. It's been brilliant. You know, as we said before, it's uh, it's fantastic uh, just to create the dialogue. And a lot of the questions that I asked you, how do we change this stigma? How do we improve that? How do we get this better? You say, just have a conversation. Be mm. open and talk mm. about it and educate. And hopefully this can contribute towards that improvement of a better sex life. So uh, thank you so much for coming on. Well, good luck. Because I think you've done a brilliant job. And if <laughs> only all kids could be educated like you, we'd all grow up to be like you, which is a good thing. <laughs> thank you so much, Tracy. Okay. Guys, I hope you have enjoyed the video. If you have, make sure to drop a like on it. Subscribe, comment, all that usual stuff. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.